So how do you feel right now? It's strange to come into a space and be and know like, why did you why did you come here today? Basically to like take off my clothes and talk about stuff. Hi, I'm a professional. <laughs> I have on my actual business cards, um, Sophista Ratchet Black Academic. I am an academic, but I'm a black academic. I'm a black academic. I can be sophisticated, but I'm also ratchet as fuck. Like, like how do you want me to read you? Because I can do it with MLA citations, or I can just fucking come for you. Like, so can you talk about what your style says about you? For me, like clothing is also a way to let people in and put up walls. I have a lot of experience moving through spaces with white people where they don't see me as black. They almost never see me as white. They just like, I'm not really black to them, or they can easily forget and be comfortable around me both because of how I look and that I can talk like this. And they show their asses and I would like to preemptively stop them from showing their asses because then like, that's gonna hurt my feelings, it's gonna get me like, worked up, but it also it puts me at this place where I have to be on my heels because if I, if I advocate for myself, if I point out that like, bitch, you just said that, then I become a problem. The wrapping of hair has a really pointed and unique kind of history of resistance gendered and race resistance in New Orleans, because under Miro, Governor Miro, he was a Spanish governor, he introduced a set of sumptuary laws, but it also had sartorial codes, because this is a moment in New Orleans' colonial history where there's French, there's Spanish, there's Anglos, there's European-born people, there's African-born people, there's indigenous people, there's New World-born people of all those races, people who look like me. How the hell is a rich white man supposed to know when they see that if, if it's, if it is white femininity that they treat one way, or if it is black femininity, which is a very different object product thing. One of the laws was any woman of color in public had to cover their hair. This was a way to mark them as a non-person, as a non-human, as someone who you don't have to treat with the rights of humanity. And I think that Miro and the government, what they expected was for black women to um, as a way to take away their beauty and agency. Like they're just gonna wrap like burlap and like sackcloth around their heads and look stupid. But these bitches was so fly and they imported like beautiful silks and calicos to the point where even white women started to try and wear it. And Miro was just like, you guys, like we did this whole thing and now like y'all all just wanna be niggas, this is totally not okay. So I like wrapping my hair for multiple reasons, but one of them is definitely that it's like, I'm doing the same thing that my ancestors, whose name I'll never know, did. I'm being fly in a way that pushes back on these larger structures. So can you talk about um, like a big insecurity that you have been working to overcome? I definitely have a very like fraught relationship with my hair. I didn't grow up hearing somebody say, oh, Terry, like somebody goes, needs, to, needs to comb Terry's hair. I heard my dad saying, oh, somebody needs to go fix her head. That's kind of built into the way we talk about it as if, because your hair is supposed to be, it's supposed to be kept and not unruly. It's supposed to be respectable. My hair was one of the things that set me apart from the group. Um, so I went to school with rich white kids and all, they all had pools and like what happens when, um, when you go swimming. Like, and the experience of saying, oh, I, my mom said I can't get my hair wet and that being totally foreign to them and again being the problem, being the weird, being the freak. I remember um, my best friend from second to fifth grade, one time we got in a really big fight, she had a pool and we were in the bathtub after and I was like using conditioner to comb out my hair because that's what you do. And she was like, you don't need that much conditioner. You only need a dime-sized conditioner. Look, it's on the bottle. And I'm like, and it's like, what is a dime gonna do? If you only need a dime-sized amount of conditioner, you don't need conditioner. <laughs> like, what lie is this? Um, but like lots of little pieces like that where my hair was often the drop in the bucket that made me the outsider. Your parents sent you there, why? My mom, it makes more sense. My mom is darker and she never went to integrated schools. So it makes sense for her not to anticipate it. But I really don't, I, I wonder what that deal was. Like I wonder if they played dominoes and my, and my dad lost. White folks was always showing them his ass and like being horrible in his presence because they were so comfortable. They couldn't see him. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder my dad as someone with that experience, why on God's green earth 
he would have put me in a school with all those white kids. Without knowing that I was actively learning it, part of what I was learning was always to be watching other people to see if I was fitting in, if I was doing it right, which meant that I was very keyed into other people's levels of comfort, other people's safety, and prioritizing that above me. And then when it would bubble up, when I would explode, I never exploded in those directions. I always exploded back home, either to like people around me who were actually on my side or at myself. And so part of what I've increasingly been working on and that I'm much better at now is recognizing that like, I care more about me and mine than you and yours. And if you want me, then like, you're welcome. I also do it now by um, refusing questions. Questions like, what are you mixed with? Or what are you? The answer they expect is a polite, a polite one. I, I hear my father coming out of my mouth. Women in my family always been beautiful and y'all men always been rapists. Because why should I have to give you a history lesson about something that you and yours have systematically erased? You committed a sin. I didn't do shit. Me and mine didn't do shit. These are my Rihanna socks. Mm -hmm. Is that no? They're really, um, really They cute. say BBHM, but bitch better have my money. <laughs> right? I get that. I'd fallen into these patterns where I was doing free labor for groups that I was only provisionally inside of or not inside of. And that took my energy, it took my time, it made it so that I could never just be, like I could never exist without also mediating my image of myself, my understanding of myself through someone else's lenses. Like I could never, I could never center myself because I was constantly concerned with making sure that the, uh, that whatever, the center of whatever group I was rotating around was comfortable. I do not have time to baby adults because I have actual babies who like are cute, smart, and funny, and they're my retirement plan. I strategize before I go into situations, and I've gotten better at saying, no, I'm not gonna go. My social life has changed a lot, and like my social circles have changed a lot. They've gotten a lot blacker and a lot browner because I'm not as nice to white people, so they're not as comfortable around me. When do you feel the most vulnerable? The types of situations that I feel most vulnerable in, the places that I feel most vulnerable in, are in places where I'm moving through and across difference, but I'm trying to go to bridge that gap with people who I care about who are different from me. Like my husband's white and his family is from the rural Midwest, a very, very white town, um, population of 1400. I think at the last census it was like 95% white. I very much love my mother-in-law. Like I love my husband's family. Like I think they're kind people and good people but they are also a product of their world and their world is one that denies my humanity and my existence. And I cannot speak that without hurting them, but if I, if I wrap it up so it doesn't hurt them as much, then the work is not done and they're gonna be able to continue to hurt me. And that's a really like vulnerable space because I've chosen to be there. I chose. So what have you done? I don't know, I made my mother-in-law cry. I was in Chicago like two weekends ago and I made her cry. I do it all the time, I'm always a problem. Mm -hmm. um, what did you say? Or what was it about? It was about um, the election. So this election was the first time that her county, which they're very active in, the political machine for, um, went red. And I'm like, bitch, for 10 years, I've been telling you the people you live around are snakes. Like for 10 years, you have looked at me like I am crazy, like I am oversensitive, like I am a fucking problem. And now you wanna sit and like have me, have me be your feelings, mammy, because like, wah? Like, you know what demographic didn't do some fuck shit this election? Mine. Like black women did what we have always done, which is put our fucking heads down and get, like do what needs to be done because we don't move through the world with the assumption that it is ours, with the assumption that we can be fair and whole unless we advocate for ourselves. And like, but that's really mean to say to someone. The only good way that I can look at that, this is that it's exposed all of the 
lies that everyone's been telling. Well, but see, here's the thing too: is like it's gonna happen right now because this is one of the things. Like when I say like I deny a premise of a question and like and move forward from there. That's not an objective statement. That's a positioned statement. Mm -hmm. Like the lies, they're exposed. Like we've been fucking knowing. You know what right. I mean? Like. Like my people knew in right. the 1700s right. when white men took us into their beds, then called us nigger and sold away our children. Like we have known right. this deeply. It has been proven to us again and again and again and again. We have tried to shout it and you have chosen not to hear. Mm -hmm. I cannot, I do not, and I refuse to fall into a kind of narrative of hope because now everybody knows, like, but y'all been knowing. But that isn't to say I'm not hopeful or I'm completely pessimistic. My my optimism comes from a very different place. My optimism doesn't come from, oh, now it's exposed and the lies are exposed. My optimism comes from when they first brought us here. We were not brought as humans. We were defined as non-humans. We were brought for a purpose. Our citizenship is conditional. Our right to be here is conditional. Our humanity is conditional to the country, which is now also ours, which has always been also ours. And from that point forward, we have consistently maintained our sense of self. That's a radical act. That's a resistant act. Mm -hmm. At emancipation, there were three, three million individuals who did that. My like, optimism comes not from like, oh, maybe we'll all get better, because I don't think, I think this country is at its core defective. I think it's at its core rooted in a delusion that is cruelty and cannot be kind and cannot be human. What me and mine have consistently done is defied that and recognized ourselves as human and enacted our humanity. And like that to me is optimistic and hopeful. Why in your body, why in your skin, why in your journey? Why is it a good place to be? I think when I think about my body and my life and my world, the fact that I can exist at all, but especially that I can exist on the ground in this place which is, you know, this is the ground that my grandmothers lived on and that their mothers lived on and that we built while our bodies were used as capital, while our bodies were used as something for the dominant to define themselves against. We did all of the work to allow for the radical imagination to build a city to build a civilization here, to build a people here. I'm happy to exist on this like sinking edge of the world because so many who came before me fought so that I could. And like, so like I'm obliged to do it, but also they fought so that I could do it in such a way and be fucking awesome. So like, how could I not think it's the best? You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> I don't know. How do you feel? That was, yeah. How do you feel now? I sort of wish I'd worn deodorant because I'm kind of sweaty. <laughs> also considering like, I made 30 this year and I got three kids and things that used to like go to the sky no longer do. Damn. Feeling okay. In my sexy granny drawers. 